All right, Pete, it's July, and let's start the virtual planetarium as we usually do with the inner solar system. Okay. So Mercury. Mercury is a morning planet at the start of July. Um, it shines at a magnitude minus 0.7 and rises 70 minutes before the sun on the 1st of July. But because it moves around the sun so rapidly, by the time of the 7th of July... Uh, although it's brightened, it now rises only 55 minutes before the sun. So don't have long uh, to catch it. No, not really. It reaches superior conjunction on the 16th of July, after which it re-emerges into the evening sky. But unfortunately, for the UK at least, it's poorly placed at that time. On the 25th of July, um, it's at magnitude minus 1.0, but it just it sets about 35 minutes after the sun, so that's going to be really difficult to grab it. Um, but there is a thin 1% lit waxing crescent moon close to it on the evening of the 29th of July, when Mercury will be shining at minus 0 0.7 and, well, not much improvement really, setting for <laughs> 40 minutes after the sun. Yeah, it's really tough to see Mercury for in K at this time of year. The best time is spring and in autumn, but uh, might catch yep. it at the start of July. Uh, moving further out there, the planet Venus, this has also in the morning sky, it's quite a brilliant object, magnitude minus 3.8. Yeah. On the 1st of July, it rises 110 minutes before the sun, and that increases to 120 minutes minutes by the end of the month and I've been following it in the daytime sky uh, I managed to get it the first time I saw it it was at dichotomy so 50% illuminated and Venus is now moving away from us in its orbit and the phase is increasing and it's now uh, uh, in the sort of gibbous phase so but by July it'll be about 90% lit won't it yeah um, so uh, practically full really um, yeah but only 10 arc seconds across so quite small really yeah. quite small for Venus there's a slender waning crescent moon uh, nearby on the morning of the 26th of june it'll be a six percent lit waning crescent on that morning and then on the following morning it'll be nearby as well but as a two percent lit waning crescent so pretty thin yes um so that's venus uh moving out planet mars so the excitement is building. We're less than six <laughs> very months. Very slowly. <laughs> very slowly, as it always is with Mars. But we are actually less than six months away from the next opposition of Mars, which occurs on the 8th of December of this year. And it's around this time that the planet starts to move into a better position and gets better. Yes. The observing prospects really start to increase. So on the 1st of July, it's at magnitude 0.5 and seven arc seconds across oh, when viewed through a telescope. That's enough for an eight-inch reflector to start to see details. Yeah, so yeah. it's a good time to make a start. Uh, and we'll see a number of features. There's the southern polar cap, which is should be a visible bright white spot at the top of the disk if you're... It can be quite striking, that, can't it? It can be. And I always find, because there's large gaps when you observe Mars, because it's got it doesn't come to opposition for every two years rather than every year yeah. like the other planets... Uh, it takes a long time to get back into observing it and seeing the details. Oh, it does. Yes, absolutely. So yeah. I always find... So it, I'm, it's easier to follow Mars when it's smaller after opposition and you've been doing it for a while than when you start the opposition and you're trying to get used to seeing detail on a small disk. But it's all That's, a, that's a very good point, actually, yeah, because it, it's, it's actually... Um, when it's really small like this, and this is when people start to look at it as it's appearing in the morning sky, they can get put off because it is hard. It it's is hard. It's hard to see any detail. And, of course, by the time opposition comes along, you might have got fed up with it and thought, oh, I'm never going to see anything on Mars, I'm just not going to bother. But that's actually completely wrong you've you've got to persist at this point and just get used to what it looks like and if you do that things can only get better up until the beginning of december that's um, and, and they will right. they will yeah that's absolutely right. it's like training for a marathon with mars you've got to start early and put in the hours so if you start observing now as often as you can uh, as you say, Pete, by the time we get to opposition, you'll notice a lot of fine detail on the disk, even with a six, eight inch telescope. And then you'll be able to continue building on that as Mars passes away from us for a few more months after opposition. So really worth starting. Yes, it is. And of course, by the end of the month, there will be some changes with the planet anyway, because it will have the planet will have brightened to about mag plus 0 0.2 and its disk size will have actually increased to eight arc seconds. Woo! But it's, an extra it's, arc second. It's an extra <laughs> arc second. Um, but the planet's phase will be showing as well, so you'll see an, it as an 84% lit 
disc on the 31st of July. And the southern pole's tilt angle will have reduced um, so that it's inclined to Earth by about 14 degrees. And that will move the southern pole slightly further away from us. And added to that, with increased warming in the planet's southern hemisphere, the pole will also be reducing, the polar cap will be reducing, so it'll be harder to see at the end of the month. Yes, it will be shrinking as it becomes summer in the southern hemisphere on Mars. The, yeah. the cap, as you say, will evaporate. But it will be building in the northern hemisphere. And what's great about this type of opposition, this transitional one, uh, is that you can get to see both the north and south poles Absolutely. at the same yes. time during this. Whereas normally you only get the north or the south. So something to look forward to. OK, well, um, there is also a 35% lit waning crescent moon 4.5 degrees to the east of Mars on the 22nd of July. Um, which is, is quite interesting, actually, because that's ahead of an interesting event which will happen on opposition night when the moon will occult Mars. So the moon will, as it does its monthly pass uh, around the planet, so it'll get quite close to Mars several times, but we would do have a favourable occultation due to occur on the morning of the 8th of December. Yes, I'm just hoping, Pete, that the whole thing isn't occulted by clouds. That's the main thing that I'm concerned about. Oh, you're about. so <laughs> cheerful, aren't you? Although that's often the case. But on the 31st of July, Mars will be 1.8 degrees from Mag plus 5.8 Uranus. So those two planets will be quite close in the sky as well. Um, Jupiter, Jupiter's interesting at the moment, isn't it? Because it's not in a zodiacal constellation. It's actually in the constellation of Cetus, the whale or sea monster. Not for very long, obviously, but um, it is there. And so that's going to upset any uh, astrologers out there. They'll probably just ignore that, as they normally do. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, controversial, Pete. <laughs> controversial. Uh, they, yes. they would have seen uh, that coming. Uh, Jupiter, is a, it's a morning planet at the moment, but over the past weeks, its position for us in the UK has been poor, uh, only appearing at low altitude before sunrise. But now we're past the June solstice and the UK's night is lengthening. Jupiter is improving for us. It is, and it's been down low really for the last what three years four years it's <laughs> it's been roof yes. grazing for everybody in the uk that's a, but, that's a good term isn't it <laughs> roof grazing it's a roof grazer so uh, but by now it's slowly improving it's steadily climbing up and there's lots and lots of detail on jupiter even a four inch telescope will show uh, most of the main bands the equatorial bands and the shadings at the poles the galilean satellites and larger telescopes will just reveal more and more. So it really and the is... the great red spot, of course, that we're yes, just... What, we're... That's about a four-inch, yeah? Yeah, I've seen it... Well, so be a bit careful. I saw it in the 1990s with a four-inch telescope, but it has shrunk quite a bit now. That's true. And, and, it, and it's no longer quite as striking as it was. But I think I would imagine it would still be visible in a four-inch telescope, yeah. It's, it is hard, actually, with that size of telescope. You're not, you're not going to see a, an amazing great red spot. It's going to be right on the edge of visibility, but it's worth yeah. having a go. It's worth and having it, a go. And it's also worth noting, if you ha haven't got a telescope, um, that Jupiter is visited by a 65 percent lit waning gibbous moon on the morning of the 19th of july the moon three degrees south of the planet at 0200 bst uh, by the end of the month uh magnitude minus 2.5 now so really quite bright jupiter manages to reach an altitude of 30 degrees in relative darkness I mean, that's some vast improvement on what we've had in complete darkness. Oh, it's luxury, last. isn't it? It really is. <laughs> so there's plenty to look forward to with Jupiter. Um, Saturn, next planet out, uh, things are slightly starting to improve here with Saturn. For It feels like half a lifetime, Saturn has been below the roofs of the houses, so not even a roof grazer. Uh, <laughs> but it is now steadily climbing up, uh, mostly thanks to the fact that we're past the solstice, as you mentioned, Pete. So we're getting the planets, so we're getting longer hours of darkness, so we get a greater opportunity to see the planets in dark skies. Um, it approaches opposition on the 14th of August, so that's next month, uh, and it'll be able to reach its highest position in the sky due south in relative darkness from mid-July onwards. Yeah. It is worth looking at Saturn, even though it is fairly low down, because there's a bit of an irony, because as it starts to climb higher in the sky, so the planet's tilt relative to the Earth will present the ring plane more edge onto us, so the visibility of the rings will become worse 
for us. <laughs> that's true, but I'll take that over sat- with Saturn being higher in the sky. That's a oh, fair any time. Any time. It is actually interesting. I haven't seen. Uh, we're recording this in May. Um, I haven't yet seen Saturn through a telescope, but I have looked to the Wind Jupos simulations, and it is interesting to notice just how much the rings have closed up since last year already. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and of course, when Saturn is edge on, we have the rare opportunity to see the Saturn satellites pass over its disk in the oh, same yes, sort of transit right. of, as Jupiter's moons do. So that uh, that is something to look forward to, even though the rings, as you say, will be practically invisible. <laughs> well, this, the ice giants uh, are in the morning skies. Everything's in the morning skies. It, it is, isn't it? Yeah, but the... Um, Uranus isn't badly placed, and as, as we mentioned before, it's quite close to uh, Mars at the end of July. But Neptune is fairly poorly located at the moment, thanks to the fact it's quite dim. So um, I think we'll wait a little bit longer before we sort of concentrate on the ice giants. So let's now uh, slip into specials mode and see <laughs> what special events are occurring throughout the month and of course because it's july we've got the second half of noctilucent cloud season running this month so it'll be interesting to see how many noctilucent cloud displays have been seen so far and whether it's going to be a good year i my, yes. my, my money is on the fact that it's probably not going to be a good year and i hope i'm wrong with that but i think that's the case because with solar activity picking up, which it has, then there is an argument which says that extra activity warms the atmosphere. So it doesn't allow it to get down to the temperature dip you need in the mesosphere for NLCs to form. So it'll be interesting to see whether we do actually get any this year. I hope we do, just so that the theory is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be interesting to see. We have had some great displays in the last few years, yes, we have. and uh, it would be interesting to see what happens. Um, on the 4th of July, we can say Happy Aphelion Day because the Earth reaches the point in its year long orbit when it's the furthest away from the sun. But that we're really not going to notice any effect, but that's when Aphelion occurs. That Actually, the most notable effect with Aphelion, for me anyway, being a solar observer, is the fact that the sun's apparent size reduces, which I've, I've got a little calcium K uh, PST telescope. And when the sun is away from Aphelion, or we, sorry, the Earth is away from Aphelion, I should say, then the sun's apparent size is large enough not to fit easily on my imaging camera's chip. But at Aphelion, it does just about do it. So it's quite convenient. <laughs> so, but only for a short period of yes, time. Yes, right. <laughs> Uh, on the 8th, uh, the moon through binoculars or small telescope in the evening will reveal uh, the illuminated arc of the Jura Mountains. These are quite impressive. Yes, um, they are. The, the mountains, the tops of the mountains glowing, well, really quite brilliantly in the sunlight. You've, so you've got the darkness, the, the shadow, and little bright speckle points of light, which are the tops of the mountains, uh, which are along the moon, moon's terminator. And the jeweled handle Claire Obscure effect is best seen at around uh, 10 past 11 in the evening BST. That's 10 past 10. UT. So that's a nice thing to look out for. And just it is. That's, that's fabulous, actually. Those are the mountains which border the sinus of Rhythm, uh, which is the Bay of Rainbows. And um, it's beautiful because it's the dawn lunar light which is catching the top of those mountains. And the uh, they arc into the darkness of the lunar nights. So you see them sort of hanging there off the off the edge of the Terminator. Very impressive. Now, talking about the moon, we have a, a full moon, would you believe, Paul, on the thir- 13th of July. <laughs> is there any cosmic significance to that? <laughs> well, the only cosmic significance is the fact that that full moon occurs at 1938 BST, and lunar perigee is on the same day at 929 BST. So that's going to be a perigee full moon so it'll be it's actually the largest full moon of the year are we going to call that a giga moon 
Shall we? <laughs> Shall we? You heard it here first, everyone. This will be the Giga Moon. <laughs> the Giga Moon, yes. Okay, so on the um, on the twenty third, again sticking with the Moon, we have a twenty six percent lit waning crescent Moon, and that'll appear four point four degrees south of the beautiful Pleiades Open Cluster. So you can see them both above the east northeast horizon from around o two hundred BST, so o one hundred UT. And on the twenty eighth. Uh, with the moon new on this date, so really practically not visible. Um, this is a great time in trying to track down an eighth magnitude comet called C stroke 2017 K2 Pan Stars. Um, it's been moving south through our Fucus during July uh, and is now coming to be quite well placed. And this is a comet I'm already trying to start to follow, and it could be quite an interesting one, couldn't it? It could. It's just unfortunate, again, it gets to its brightest point when it'll be in the southern hemisphere. But it, yes. it should be nice to watch it as it goes goes down. It's the best we've got on offer at the moment, unless something comes up in between us recording this and when this <laughs> goes out. Let's hope so. And then on the 30th, comets related again, we've got a favourable peak of the Delta Aquarid meteor shower. And that shower is best suited for viewing from more southerly latitudes. But, of course, with the moon virtually out of the way the sky conditions will be ideal for viewing it from the uk yes yeah, so there's lots of things to do we've got nice it's good that we've got a lot of uh, lunar targets which require a small telescope or binoculars because you'll have noticed that in the summer the moon is really low down and with the heat from the day really is quite affected by poor seeing but yes. that isn't too obvious in a small telescope or binoculars so lots of nice things to look for there using lower power instruments Yes, absolutely. And it, I mean, the skies are problematical at this time of year. The further north you live in the UK, the worse they get. But of course, as we head towards the end of July, then the night sky will be getting darker. And with the moon getting out of the way, that will be ideal to try and get a view of stuff. The only sadness about that, actually, is the fact that the new moon at the end of July means that the moon will be full when the um, Persid meteor shower reaches its peak. But you can't have them have it all. <laughs> Can't win them all, no. So the Northern Hemisphere summer uh, give us is here once again, and July is filled with some really quite splendid local deep sky objects. Yes. This is different from the springtime objects. These are the, ga the galaxies that are far away. These are lots of objects that are found in our own galaxy. And the Milky Way itself arches over high over the summer sky uh, and if you're in a lucky enough to get it in a dark sky it's worth just taking a look at it because it's not a uniform band of light no, it's and not. really just so mottling and structure due to the presence of dust clouds which are blocking light from the stars so it's quite a quite a fine sight i think it's also very impressive actually as it goes down to the southern horizon and the best way to see this is to to find a coast somewhere which looks out towards the south so you haven't got any light pollution and you've got a nice flat horizon and when you look at the milky way heading down towards the horizon there you see the definite bulge which is due to the core and that's really impressive and that's in the direction of or well, marked by the constellation of sagittarius the archer of course which has that very famous asterism in the core of it which is something that i remember patrick Moore would he'd never acknowledge that would he he would he would always argue that he couldn't see it but that's called the the teapot and it looks exactly like a teapot sorry it, uh, i'm not i'm not sure it's a how it's a very famous asterism in fact i've only ever used you say it but uh, <laughs> it does once you put the image in my head i did i do agree it does really look like a teapot and uh, the, I suppose you could think of the, uh, the the globular clusters extending from it as part of the steam from a brewing cup of tea. <laughs> well, yes, and it, it and you know some people say it sort of um, does bad things to a constellation. It gives a, a, it trivialises these majestic constellations when you create these these popular shapes in them but they're there to help you navigate that's why we create asterisms and and since constellations themselves are entirely arbitrary it's a somewhat null complaint isn't it well it because... is yeah and, <laughs> and you can actually there's there's quite an interesting pattern there anyway because the uh it's the tip of the i've got to get this right haven't i the tip of the lid <laughs> and where the lid joins the spout those two stars, and the star at the bottom of the spout. They're called Caus Borealis at the top, 
or the northern one. Kaus Mediae, I think it's called now, um, which is the middle one. And the lower one is Kaus Australis. And the word Kaus means bow. So that's, that's the archer's bow that you're looking at there. Wow. I did not know that. And in 10 minutes' time, I will have forgotten. But still, it's a, <laughs> it is a very nice constellation. Actually, the best time I ever saw uh, uh, the, that constellation, Sagittarius, uh, was probably in the south of France when it was a lot higher. Uh, and you're quite right, Pete. The bulge of the galaxy is quite unmistakable there. If, you look, if you're on the south coast of France looking out to sea, um, then you, you get some really nice views of it there. Um, there's quite a lot of highlights to offer, um, but we might. where do we start? The Summer Triangle, I suppose, is as good a place as any. Yes. Um, this is an asterism which is very, very easy to see. Um, it's made up of three bright stars. That's Vega, Deneb and Altair. Vega, obviously the brightest star in the constellation of Lyra the Lyre, uh, a bluish-white colour, and it's really quite easy to identify. You just go outside and almost look straight up in the summer and it's there. And it's got that vertically elongated diamond of stars just to the south of it, which forms the body of the harp like instrument or the lyre as it's known actually the um the star in the upper or it's the northwest corner of that elongated diamond um which is zeta lyri and vega uh, form one side of an equilateral triangle and the other side is formed is marked by epsilon lyri which is the double double which is is it two stars and if you look at the stars through a telescope they are double again but they're quite close to each other those two those two pairs but the main pairs the the, t the two stars which appear singular um, under low magnification they can be split with the naked eye yes I've, I've managed to do that when the constellation is up overhead and i have managed to split epsilon lyrae to see the double double in a four inch telescope right it does need high power yes it does but it can be done it can be done so uh, it's a good test for your optics to see if you can do that yeah well well roughly midway between the two bottom stars of that diamond of course you've got the wonderful ring nebula m57 and that is slightly below that line slightly south of that line and so slightly nudged over to the west so it's slightly closer to the western star and it's quite difficult actually when you're starting out you may look for it and you may miss it and that's because it's relatively small and at low magnification it looks just like a sort of slightly fuzzy star so you've got to find what you think is the ring nebula and then pile on the magnification if you've got it right you'll see a disc if you've got a small telescope and if you've got a larger telescope you'll see a disc with an apparent dark patch in the center which is the hole which is where it gets the name the ring nebula from yeah it's quite a striking object i'm always surprised by how its surface brightness quite is quite a bright object uh, obviously you don't see all the color and structure you see in images you're not going to see that with uh with the eye but it is quite striking an eight inch telescope the um the whole central hole of the nebula is quite uh, is quite easy to discern and with the 12 inch telescope that i used when i looked at this a couple of years back um you can see fainter stars in there yes um i've managed to see the central star but only with a big telescope um yes the I've, university I've telescope seen... actually 20 inches uh I, th I saw it with Patrick's 15-inch telescope, but it was right on the edge of visibility. It was just coming in and disappearing again. It was it was quite tricky to see. Well, that's an example of what's known as a planetary nebula. That's a, a sort of medium mass star which just basically gets to the end of its life and puffs off its outer layers into space and those layers appear to glow with the the core of the star which puffed them off left behind typically a white dwarf star and there are numerous examples of these objects up in the sky and there is one in the constellation of Vulpecula actually it's quite it's not too far from the bottom star in the northern cross which is part of Cygnus the Swan and the bottom star the southern star there is Alberio which is um, Beta Cygni and uh, that's a beautiful object to look at through a telescope because it's a, a wonderful double star a, an azure a blue secondary with a bright golden 
yellow primary. It's quite stunning, isn't it's it? It's a striking star. It's one of my favourite double stars in the night sky. I can't remember whether they're gravitationally bound or not, but if they are, or if there's planets around there, I imagine sunrise and sunset would be really quite striking. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, if you um, locate the... Remember the elongated diamond I mentioned below Vega? Um, if you locate the star in the the lower left corner, so that south east corner of that, and you extend a line from that star, that's Gamma Lyrae, through Alberio, and extend it for the same distance again, you'll arrive at M27, the Dumbbell Nebula, which is another example of a planetary nebula. And this one's quite large, and it can be seen in binoculars. Um, and it's it's interesting, because when you look at it through an optical instrument you'll see that it has uh, two dark patches either side of the core so it, it makes it look as if it's pinched in at the waist and that's where it gets its name the dumbbell it looks a bit like an apple core doesn't it it looks more like an apple core to me than a dumbbell yes <laughs> it looks okay. like someone's taken a couple of bites out either side okay well there's loads of interesting things around here um and between volpecula and the little constellation of Sagitta, the arrow, um, is a rather lovely unassociated grouping of stars, which is known as Brocky's Cluster, or the Coat Hanger Cluster. And amazingly, that can be seen with the naked eye as well. If you've got really clear skies and you focus on that region carefully, you should be able to make out that tiny little cluster, but it looks fantastic through a small telescope or binoculars. Yes, uh, uh, around this area as well, there are uh, there's some... Um... Some nice variable stars as well, if you're into observing that. I think Sagitta the Arrow is actually quite a charming little constellation. Uh, and Delphinus in particular also does look to me like a small dolphin leaping up. It's one of those unlikely constellations which has a very few number of stars, uh, not a particularly bright constellation, but does look somewhat like what they're supposed to be. Absolutely. Um, I mean, Delphinus is the dolphin, as you've mentioned, and that sometimes it's because it's, it's a little diamond pattern with a tail coming off it. It's supposed to represent the, the nose of a bottlenose dolphin, um, and the tail is supposed to represent the beginning of the neck of the dolphin. But it sometimes gets mistaken for the Pleiades would you believe because it's got it's got that little box shape with the line coming down and for people who are un unfamiliar with the sky when they see it because it's so distinctive they do mistake it for the Pleiades open cluster but the Pleiades is tighter than that and it's it's more distinctive really but it is a fantastic constellation to have a look at so we've we've had a good look around that region of sky and I think um, what we'll do is we'll we'll probably leave it there and then move back into this region to have a look at a few more objects as we head into next month when the skies will be darker still so i hope you've enjoyed our little recording here and um, all that remains for me to say is thank you very much paul thanks pete